Now we are starting the second talk in the very first day of our school, DPVSA. Uh, our guest is Marta Mrak. Uh, I hope this pronunciation is fine, Marta. Perfect. Uh, Nobody the... here pronounce it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she is a lead of research and development engineer at BBC uh, and her talk will be entitled Learning to Predict Pixels for Content Enhancement and Delivery. Uh, Marta is once again the lead of R&D uh, engineer at BBC R&D Center. Uh, she is honorary professor at the Queen Mary University of London. Uh, and she's also multimedia and vision research from, from the multimedia vision research group. Uh, she's um, at IEEE, she is the chair of SPS Multimedia Signal Processing Technical Committee and a member of the CAS Multimedia System and Application Technical Committee. So uh, means that she's a chair and, and member in technical committees from both uh, societies are uh, our technical sponsors, CAS and SPS. Uh, her research is focused on video compression fundamentals, new content experience and data analytics. Marta served as general co-chair of the IEEE ICME in 2020 and was the lead TPC chair for the IEEE ICME in 2019. She has organized numerous workshops and special sessions at conferences, and in addition to special issues in journals. Uh, during 2000, between 2013 and 2018, Marta was the area editor of the Signal Processing Image Communication Journal, and she was also appointed as uh, associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Multimedia in 2018. Uh, she's also associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Image Processing in 2019. Uh, certainly, this is just a very short introduction of her uh, resume. Uh, and we are very happy to have you here, uh, Marta. Uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we have a very flexible uh, time. We have 90 minutes for your talk and for the discussions we may have. So please take your time. Uh, and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for, for this uh, very extensive uh, uh, introduction um, and for welcoming me to this uh, special school. I use this uh, opportunity to actually try to share my screen and uh, play with my Zoom while you were um, introducing me. So. Can I just please ask you which screen do you see from me? At this moment, I see your uh, the shared screen and yourself. So I have uh, each one of the attendees can choose the size, but uh, the, uh, of each one of those views, but both are available to us. All right, and uh, you can see full screen my presentation. It's not the one in presenters uh, mode. It's full screen. Um, yes, yes, it's full screen, uh, the, the, just just the slide itself. All right, um, not uh, other windows, that's that's great. Um, so uh, I feel uh, very privileged to, to be um, part of uh, the, the great uh, program that you created and uh, it's, it's really a nice opportunity to share our work. Um, unfortunately, yes, we, we we don't see each other um, you know, physically. And uh, I hope that you know, when next uh, school happens, we'll have a chance for more closer collaboration. But let's let's try to, to uh, find ways to, to keep connected and uh, communicate uh, our research and uh, have new ideas together and see how we can collaborate. And um, basically, um, Please uh, uh, let me know if you see any problems with my presentation. My broadband is down today. <laughs> um, however, I hope that uh, the hotspot will do its job efficiently. So again, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for uh, joining in such a big number. 
And uh, first of all, I would like to tell you a little bit uh, more about this fascinating uh, organization where I've been working for, for more than 10 years now. Um, you, uh, BBC is a UK's public service uh, broadcaster and it's nearly 100 years old. In two years, it will be 100 years old. And uh, people all around the world uh, know about BBC content, especially news. Uh, it is consumed in uh, around the world in 40 languages. This is uh, a very important uh, reason why, why its penetration is so big. Uh, currently, global reach of the BBC is uh, higher than ever. Uh, this is a number in this slide which shows uh, that nearly half a billion people uh, this summer, uh, within one week, joined BBC services. So the main reason for such impressive reach is most probably the fact that international news services rank first for trust and reliability, which was very important also during this pandemic that unfortunately um, affected um, every corner of the world. world. Uh, what is probably less obvious about the BBC is that it always relied on latest advances in technology to reach audiences. Uh, currently, reaching half a billion people uh, weekly is possible only because of various uh, digital platform. So uh, we have a large engineering group that works with various partners to enable 24-7 service. And there is also a small department in this group, which is research and development. We don't uh, work 24-7, and this is where I work. Uh, but it's very vibrant and a great uh, place to work. And our, our job is to take, um, uh, to, to look at uh, various technology and support BBC uh, long term. So uh, let me move to the next slide. Um, basically in R&D, um, we work on fundamental technology research, diving deep into promising topics. We have around, around 200 engineers and scientists, and uh, we also very strongly rely on a number of partnerships, international and national uh, partnerships, uh, typically supported by some research uh, grants and programs. Uh, this is very important for the, to, to widen the scope of our uh, research. So, uh, now uh, about this talk actually finally my specialism is in uh, visual data processing so i will talk about some of my recent work in that area and uh, this week we have great program we will hear talks that address various visual content processing aspects i'll focus on two very specific ways of learning to predict pixels and uh, in two very different scenarios, actually. Uh, the first one is uh, learning to predict color pixels uh, using um, uh, deep learning, in particular generative adversarial networks. Um, and this is very challenging, predicting color pixels because the ambiguity of the task. So uh, for, for for this task of colorization of black and white video, we have a lot of freedom. And also such tasks usually can be done offline. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'll also talk about a scenario that is different in many respects. Uh, it is video compression and it targets real-time execution, right, on, on, on user devices. Um, and so for, for some critical scenarios we we need to lower the the complexity of deep learning and we have to make sure that deep learning is uh, robust so there is no space for ambiguity in this uh, part of the talk i'll again show how to learn to to predict pixels but i'll demonstrate I'll focus more on demonstrating need for interpretability and explainability of uh, AI. So um, let me go to the next slide. Uh, Bruno, just to quickly check. So far, so good, this connection? Yes, so far, so good. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so basically, uh, visual content enhancement in the context of this talk uh, mainly uh, refers to making pixels look better. And there are a few areas uh, where deep learning can help. Where uh, learning how to make pixels better uh, can be super helpful. So uh, such applications are, for example, the noising of videos, uh, removal of artifacts, uh, color adjustments, and so on. So, uh, in, this, uh, in this slide, you you should that it might not uh, work very well to the the poor bandwidth connection. Uh, the purpose here is basically uh, to uh, demonstrate how uh, deep learning uh, works on visual data. On a very simple example, when we have various layers of uh, uh, deep network and then visualizing the activations in each of the, of the layers. So overall, when uh, we try to learn how to predict pixels uh, with deep learning, um, the, the effectiveness of these algorithms come from their ability to capture spatial relationship of pixels. And uh, typically, we use 2D convolutions in majority of layers for an enhancement network. So uh, you can notice that in this example, at the beginning, if I maybe can show with a pointer here, um, we have more details in the features and later on layers extract more global features. So these are the sort of basic blocks of, of uh, learning to predict pixels uh, algorithms and uh, we, we play with them and see how to arrange them in a, in a different ways depending on the task uh, we, we try to solve. We try to move to the next slide. Which is still the same one. Um, I believe this is this video can also play. So just to be show successful validation of this powerful tool, this video demonstrates how pixels in video can be enhanced. So on the left hand side. Uh, you can see simply upsampled video. Let me show maybe one frame only. And uh, you, if you look carefully, you will see that it is blurred. On the right hand side, you can see how it looks when a uh, uh, specific deep convolutional network adds details. Look, for example, on the number um, plate here on this uh, right hand side, you should see much sharper results. Or, for example, um, I hope you see one of the last frames. Here we have very blurry, blurry bars, and here they are much better. So this is, this is quite uh, well known, already state of the art, and uh, used a lot. Um, but hopefully here you can see that uh, how powerful um, enhancement uh, can be done when appropriate learning methods are, are used. So this is actually uh, one specific algorithm that um, uh, we, our partners um, shared with us in one of our research and innovation collaborations. And uh, motivated by, by these results, we try to see uh, how else we can improve uh, video and predict pixels. Uh, in particular, a uh, very, very uh, challenging task is uh, image colorization. Uh, when it comes to, for example, uh, old videos, black and white videos, um, that uh, 
do not have colors, just uh, uh, gray, uh, grayscale frames. The question um, might not be, uh, uh, this problem might not be applicable to or too many scenarios, but for us, uh, the fact is that uh, a lot of historical content uh, simply doesn't have co color and uh, colorizing the frames manually is, is a very time consuming task. So consuming that even 40 years ago attempts were made to, to colorize images with help of computers. Uh, for example, this uh, landing to the moon is hand colorized. Um, a lot has been improved in 40 years and some uh, fascinating results were obtained uh, modern restoration techniques very recently. For example, um, this very nicely colorized examples from the video of World War One. This is what the original video looked like and this is how enhanced uh, video um, can be. Um, very recently, uh, various uh, semi-automatic colorization techniques emerged. And in particular, this example shows interesting tool in which person uh, indicates color for specific, for specific regions of a grayscale image. Like here, these two are grayscale images. And the program then automatically colorizes the whole image. Obviously, this uh, produces great results, but it did something like this uh, requires a lot of manual effort and um, artistic experience. So this is another uh, semi-automatic uh, way to colorize uh, images, where actually person doesn't have to manually select color for each image region. Um, in this uh, example, for example, if, if you look here at this uh, left top corner, black and white uh, images is colorized by providing an example, example of how the, the colors should look in that image. Or, I mean, you can see uh, more um, groups of three images for each one of them. You have black and white image, you have example, and then result of automatic colorization. And this is very realistic and very, very nice. And still manual effort is needed and depending on the application, uh, uh, a lot of uh, artistic experience might be required. So we actually looked at enabling end-to-end uh, -end, uh, machine learning solutions, which don't require absolutely any um, input from user to colorize images. So there are a few uh, techniques uh, available uh, already, but uh, early techniques for colorization of uh, black and white uh, images in an end-to-end -end, uh, manner suffered um, uh, and uh, deliver the saturated uh, uh, results because only L1 um, loss was used during training of such networks. So basically, if, if you imagine that you here have uh, lots of uh, um, black and white uh, uh, cars, grayscale cars, the, 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 the algorithm the early algorithm didn't know how to colorize them in uh, in a vibrant natural colors. They would end up uh, colorizing them in, in something that is, that is very, very brownish. Uh, and this happens especially if, if we train on a large database uh, of images and uh, that try to capture many different um, many different examples. Uh, this is where uh, GANs helped us, and um, this uh, powerful uh, uh, network, pix to pix uh, is used for various um, various colorization, various uh, image uh, um, 
to image translation tasks. One is colorization. So in our experiments, uh, we actually uh, noticed that the, the results we are getting just by applying pix to pix are not sufficiently colorful. So um, there is always with GANS a lot of room for improvement. And I will go more deep into this uh, network to explain how we uh, repurposed uh, off the shelf solution. So basically uh, a very adaptive GAN framework to, to do um, the task efficiently. So um, in, in, in GANs, which uh, consists of uh, uh, generator and discriminator, the goal is to obtain uh, efficient generator, this box here. And in this specific pix to pix framework, uh, these generators is unit. This is encoder and uh, decoder with these skip connections between mirrored layers in encoder and decoder stacks. So uh, this specific uh, GAN is actually a, a conditional uh, GAN because um, of, of this input conditioning the, what the discriminator is doing. So in, in, uh, in particular, the result uh, of, uh, of a generator, in our case should be colored image, uh, which is conditioned uh, with this grayscale input. And uh, in, uh, in GAN typically, we have uh, both uh, generator and discriminator competing against each other during training in order to improve their performance. And discriminator during training learns to classify between fake and real images. Fake means uh, an image that is obtained by generator, like in this example. So this is our generator. We, we condition it with uh, the black and white image. It gives this output and the discriminator uh, uh, ideally recognizes that this is a fake image. If this is actually the real image and that in, ideally this discriminator would uh, recognize that this is a real image. Of course, um, if a discriminator um, starts very much uh, guessing correctly what is fake and what is real, generator will try to improve and produce better and better images. And uh, this is how um, we uh, changed this uh, um, conditional uh, GAN. Basically, um, in, this is the unit, the, the generator, and this is the discriminator. We uh, made a, a, a number of changes uh, during training, and I will now go one by one to explain uh, how to how to enable successful colorization of uh, black and white images. So first of all, we um, uh, continue to use batch normalization, which uh, typically accelerate learning. So uh, batch normalization means that for all these mini batches N, uh, we take one by one features for all heights and, and uh, widths. And uh, in, in such a, a set, we um, compute internal mean and variance to normalize each of the feature channels separately. So uh, this stabilizes uh, GANs a lot and enables uh, good learning. 
Uh, however, uh, what is also important is to add some uh, instance normalization. So as you can see here, we take uh, this uh, ins instance, so it's, it's not everything for mini batch. This is just one instance. And um, on them, we wanted to uh, perform normalization in order to uh, here, closer to the pixels, as you can see, we perform instance normalization only closer uh, to the pixels themselves to remove uh, uh, problems with different styles of uh, training data. Still, we use uh, batch normalization in deeper layers, and this uh, combination of instance and batch normalization seems to work uh, very well. Uh, then finally, uh, at the decoder, uh, we decided to use spectral normalization. And in particular, uh, that means that uh, weights of each layers are during training scaled uh, by the maximum um, uh, weight in order to uh, provide more uh, stability during training and prevent bigger oscillations. So what uh, this uh, specific graph um, here is showing is that if we look at only L1 loss without the adversarial loss, um, uh, the, we, we don't want this loss to be the only one, right? We don't want to minimize L1 uh, loss fully, because in that case, our results will be very desaturated. We want some degree of this loss in order to produce colorful images. And in this case, uh, we have um, this loss uh, better reflected when we use instance and batch normalization and spectral normalization. And then if you look at the whole uh, uh, loss of the, of, the, of the gun, we can see that, for example, for uh, batch normalization, we would get uh, um, stuck uh, up there, the loss wouldn't go down. But then because of the introduction of, uh, of uh, spectral loss, we, we have quite good results. And this, is, this is actually good. It doesn't have to always uh, uh, keep falling because we want sort of competition uh, during training be between uh, discriminator and uh, generator. <clears throat> so um, we also, uh, for colorization, uh, want some, um, some colorful details. And in order to uh, sort of have globally and locally good uh, good colorization results, we implemented um, discriminator at different scales in order to capture various, um, various colorization, let's say, scales. This really boosts um, uh, colors in uh, small areas and local details. And finally, I would like to show you here the example during training where the inputs are grayscale images. They go to generator and during the, the each um, epoch, discriminator and generator uh, compete. And here are the results sort of that we are getting at different stages. So let's say these are the final results. And as you can see, compared uh, with ground suit, they, they're of course not the same, but uh, quite uh, believable. And uh, most important uh, is the goal here was the co colorful. We also have this code available. If you, if you are interested, you can download it and play with it. Uh, obviously with this beer, the algorithm didn't quite give quite a good result, but uh, this is what it is what, uh, with learned algorithms. And um, in, in a paper that, that we published, you can uh, find also more results of, of how we basically um, measure and evaluate guns. Guns are super difficult to evaluate. What does it mean to, to, to get, give a 
you know, good colorization results. In our case, uh, we decided to measure colorfulness of uh, our results. This blue line, for example, shows a histogram of one color channel uh, of the originals, of, of original um, color frame. And here for different uh, combinations, which we addressed, we plot uh, how uh, the, 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 the um, histograms look like. So more narrow the histogram is, more problematic uh, uh, the, the colorization is because it's more or less, uh, you know, brownish images. We want a much wider, much wider colors. Second. Much wider color histograms, basically. Here we have uh, more more examples. Um, in this uh, case, uh, you can see that um, you know when when we add, for example, uh, multi-scale uh, discriminator, we have more details, uh, more colorful details than before, and. Uh, also globally, the colors are uh, reasonable in these examples. Future work, uh, we can say current work, uh, ongoing work is focusing on further adding some perceptual losses and extension of this work to video colorization, uh, high resolution uh, image and video colorization as well. So, this uh, is basically uh, uh, all about um, learning how to colorize pixels. And in the next part of uh, this lecture, I will talk more about learning uh, to predict pixels for video compression. So on this slide, um, you can see a, sort of a summary of three video coding standards. There are more of them, but these three are quite popular. Um, here, uh, the, the, the thickness of these wires represents sort of a bandwidth. So AVC, more than 15 years old, develop, uh, standardized, and was actually a video streaming enabler. Its availability enabled us to, to do this sort of um, uh, video conferences and, and streaming that we do nowadays. So HEVC came more than five years uh, ago and roughly 10 years after AVC and um, it required only 50% of the bitrate for to deliver same quality as AVC. Because of that it enabled UHD and HDR string. Just a couple of months ago um, H266 <laughs> VVC um, has been um, uh, approved, standardized. Um, it's uh, amazingly efficient uh, compression standard. Um, however, it is still not yet, you know, what is this killer app? What is it going to enable? But uh, it is very interesting to see that. And all these are uh, standards that uh, basically can be implemented in, in many devices and uh, widely used. Uh, in parallel with this standard development, um, during last maybe five years, we have a lot of research uh, going on on compression of video using machine learning. And that compression of uh, videos um, is not yet uh, typically at stage that uh, machine learning, deep learning based codec that is end to end machine learning can be deployed on, on any mobile phone, on your set of box and so on. There is a, a lot of uh, work going on uh, and there is something in between. 
such end-to-end -end deep learning solutions and these standards. And today I will focus um, on that what is in the middle, which are specific tools which can be used in the, the codex, in the architecture that is similar to AVC, HEVC or VVC, um, but are smaller tools and uh, uh, also deep learning based. In particular, uh, I will focus on uh, the need of using transparent AI, transparent machine learning. So just to, you know, in the most uh, simple example, I believe, uh, explain uh, what I mean by, by transparent use of machine learning for video compression. So let's, let's try to um, go to this example. Here uh, we have a video and it's high bitrate as illustrated by this thick blue line. Before it's distributed to numerous devices, it, it has to be compressed. Here in this green box, uh, we have, let's say, encoder and these standard video encoders are um, very well understood, very well known, very well documented. We basically uh, know every single um, part of them, how they work. Uh, however, uh, they may not uh, compress the video as much as we want, which is uh, illustrated here. Uh, let's say uh, the, the, the bit rate achieved with this compression cannot uh, be, cannot reach some of the devices. So what we want to achieve by deploying some machine learning, AI algorithm within very well-known framework is to enable all users here. You see now that when we added this black AI box, now everyone can, can see videos because the bitrate is sufficiently compressed. So that looks good so far, but um, the problem is that this black box uh, relies on something that is learned. And because of that, in many cases, we don't know what it learned. We just say it is a black box, it's uh, deep learning, uh, and uh, basically um, this is an approach which cannot be uh, trusted. So in this example, uh, we show a hypothetical scenario when, uh, for example, we get some unpredictable output uh, of the black box, which basically uh, uh, sends a broken bits, which cannot be then viewed anywhere. And if we don't understand the inner workings of such black box, we may end up hypothetically in scenario like this. So to prevent this, uh, we have to uh, have more trust in these powerful technologies. We have to develop more trust. Um, and this is in this example shown here by transparent box. Transparent box instead of black box, uh, indicating that we, we can uh, fully understand what it learned, what it, uh, what it achieved. And in this case, you can see we still have sort of video delivered everywhere. Um, this transparency uh, that brings um, trustworthiness in the, in, the, in the AA system has uh, another very important benefit. And that is that once we know what AI learned, we could potentially trim it and simplify it and make it lighter and more easy to deploy. So in this example, I illustrated such simplified AI with a gold star because it's sort of trimmed, it's more easy to implement, um, it's not power hungry and it's uh, reliable. 
So what does it have to do really with video compression? I will try to demonstrate uh, in, in the next examples. Uh, here we have a traditional uh, VVC um, encoder, um, very similar to HEVC and uh, AVC. And uh, researchers are experimenting in putting uh, AI boxes uh, in, different, in different areas. And uh, as, a, as a person who worked in, uh, in video compression for, for nearly two decades, uh, it interests me a lot of what these black boxes learned that researchers uh, didn't manage to, to capture, to intuitively develop um, during the last uh, few decades. So uh, basically we try to, uh, in, a, in a couple of places where these uh, boxes are proposed to be used, try to understand what they learn and what they are actually doing and see um, if we can simplify them and use in future. Um, Typically, ex explainability of AI is used, uh, is term used for classification. Uh, for example, if, uh, if user asks, provides an image and says, what uh, type of bird is this? Then uh, our machine learning algorithm will explain that it is specific time of bird and it can even uh, explain why? So this is sort of explainability directly to the user. And uh, also it can perhaps provide some examples why it's not. This sort of explainability uh, is uh, not exactly the, something that can be applied in video compression, ex at least not in the examples we studied. And um, we had to uh, sort of uh, try to see what we can do to explain what, an, what a machine learning model learned during training. But in our case, really, we don't want to go into complications of explaining that to, to any end user. I mean, we, it's complicated enough to explain what video compression is to, to the end user that watches video. We try to explain what a machine learning algorithm learned to um, video coding engineer, to a broadcast engineer, to someone who will deploy video codec, which has these machine learning boxes, and so that this person can, tr can, can trust that this algorithm will not lead to blackout or some und undesirable um, effect. So uh, let's start with very simple, um, one of the building blocks of video codec, which is interprediction. Uh, let's uh, consider this image and uh, one feature, very significant feature of images is that uh, there is a lot of spatial correlation between pixels. Let's focus, for example, on this area of image. Um, so let's say um, our decoder is receiving data about this image and already has decoded the, the green blocks, the, sorry, the, the blocks in the, in the red shape, which let's say um, correspond to, to pixels in top left corner on this image. Then the coder tries to predict uh, what is here in the yellow box based on the pixels uh, it already knows. Right. So um, we have many uh, very good algorithms that do that already in, in a way that is fully transparent and part of the standards. But in he, here in this example, uh, we have neural network. We try to feed into neural network uh, these reference uh, pixels in the, in the red uh, shape to get out 
um, prediction for this yellow block here. So there have been uh, uh, a few uh, attempts recently to do this prediction using uh, deep learning. And uh, what is uh, typically used? So we have our, our input shape here. We want to get an output like this. And typically we, we have uh, fully connected layers. We build a network of fully connected layers. We put activation after layers, and then uh, the, the last layer synthesize this output. Um, this works. This uh, can produce uh, quite good predictions and, and improve compression performance. Um, however, if we, if we just uh, uh, copy the, 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 the weights from these layers into a video codec and use it like that, we, may not, we, we cannot guarantee that it will work uh, in a useful way all the time. So uh, here is an example of how we can simplify such network uh, in order to better understand what it learned. So it's sort of post hoc analysis. Um, uh, let's uh, uh, first uh, go to this pyramid. Here we have reference pixels. First layer of network typically uh, will uh, produce different features taking account all, all the input pixels. Then these pixels uh, will be combined. Uh, sorry, these features will be combined. Uh, their um, the number of them will be reduced. And then from them we can compute pixel by pixel. So it's very, very actually uh, time consuming um, task. So um, we try to figure out what uh, is actually, what all these layers learned and how they derive their output. Um, and in that, to, to understand that better, we disable activation functions, which might uh, sound uh, uh, like a, controversial approach, but we are not the only, only ones who find, found that um, activation functions in this uh, video compression tasks, prediction tasks are um, not necessarily required. I'll show you a couple of more examples where activations have to be the, the part of, of neural networks. In this case, they, they do not have to. In particular, uh, in, in, our, in our paper, we show how by you know, removing activations, we, we can hugely simplify this, this whole uh, process and capture all the numbers of features and uh, different uh, uh, learned uh, um, um, uh, neurons uh, into a very simple operation from which just by matrix multiplication, we can uh, derive pixels from, of the output taking into account with simple matrix multiplication, the input pixels. So this is sort of a, a way to explain what, uh, what uh, network uh, learned. And uh, in this uh, example, uh, you can see how for one uh, specific mode that was trained, uh, we can now visualize how for uh, each um, pixel of um, block that needs to be predicted, the neighboring uh, values are taken into account. So typically uh, for pixels that are down here, we will have more uh, blocks from here providing weights for their estimation. Um, for some blocks that are further away, there are different mixes. This is basically um, how this first block is predicted using uh, um, mostly pixels from surrounding area. Uh, interestingly, uh, here uh, we we learned that this uh, maybe this is expected that uh, the pixels that are further away uh, are rarely used. So we can also cut the number of operations by making uh, less 
pixels used for prediction. So once we, 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 we understand how pixels from reference are used to predict frames, uh, we can say this is our um, style algorithm. It's full, fully explained and um, we can, we can um, uh, trust how it works. So when we apply a number of such new learned uh, prediction modes since in uh, VVC, we can see that um, uh, modes uh, that are learned are used in around 30% of blocks over a variety of intracoded frames. So in this particular example, the, the red blocks um, indicate use of learned modes, while blue uh, blocks are here for traditional uh, prediction that is currently in video coding standards. <clears throat> for more details of how much actually is uh, uh, how much gain these modes uh, provide, you can check our papers. And uh, we did similar experiment for interprediction. Uh, basically, we have a lot of temporal redundancy and then inter um, uh, frame interpolation of uh, sub pixel uh, uh, sub pixel position also can be helped by using um, convolutional uh, neural networks. This is a very very simple um, network that is usually used for super resolution or um, deep blurring of images, and in this case is used uh, to help in motion compensation where uh, subpel pixels have to be estimated. In this case, we have three layers uh, which uh, can uh, learn again how to um, how to this is a residual network, how to provide uh, data that can be added to the input so that prediction can be achieved. This, um, this video shows how actually this uh, convolutional uh, network uh, works. First uh, layer takes into account uh, uh, nine by nine, nine by nine uh, features. The next one, um, is one by one convolution and the, the last one is five by five convolution. So basically to compute one pixel, there are many, many uh, operations that we have to go through in order to, to predict a pixel. Uh, so it is, uh, it, it can bring nice gains, uh, but uh, it's extremely complex. So what we did again, we um, we removed some activations. We tried to see what happens. Again, activations actually didn't hurt the removal of activation, didn't hurt the performance. And um, we now can, uh, we have a linear system that goes from input uh, block to the output one, we can combine all the learned features and, uh, and uh, build a, a very simple matrix that from 13 by 13 blocks uh, provides our predicted pixels. I must say that in this uh, case, it is still important to train each layer and then do post hoc analysis in order to uh, achieve this simplified version. So we did this for uh, all uh, half and quarter pixel positions in VVC. Uh, we can achieve a, a couple of percent gain for uh, some sequences. And what this uh, illustration uh, shows is that if these black dots are full pixels, right? And we let's say have to predict a pixel in this position here. This is how the filter to obtain a pixel at that position looks like when it's learned. 
and also this is sort of a 2D filter for uh, for this position, which is uh, half to along the x-axis and uh, along uh, y-axis is uh, three quarters. They look uh, uh, in some for some sequences very similar to um, uh, DCT based uh, filters available in the standards, but for other sequences they look differently, which then helps um, in compression because of various reasons. Again, something like this is uh, easier to uh, understand and is, uh, can be further simplified for lower complexity implementation in video codecs. Uh, and finally, we tried similar approach on um, uh, in the application of, pr of, uh, of predicting chroma from uh, LUMA samples. So when we when we do compression, we go line by line of uh, of a block of pixels, and let's say we are we are in this position here, where the yellow block is, uh, and let's say we already um, uh, compressed or decoded um, Luma part. Neighboring blocks have um, chromas already, so basically from both uh, the the luma and surrounding lumas and chromas, we can try to predict chroma here. Uh, this is uh, something uh, that has been used in, in uh, recent video coding standards, such as uh, range extension standards of uh, HEVC and also in the, in the VVC, we have um, efficient chroma for luma predictions. Uh, however, these uh, algorithms uh, that are used there are quite limited and we, we build a network, neural network, that has uh, uh, improved prediction of chroma. In particular, um, the inputs to this network are uh, boundary samples that are um, LUMA and two chromas, as well as collocated LUMA input. And uh, what is uh, uh, powerful about this uh, algorithm is that it has an uh, attention module which uh, um, manipulates the boundary and based on them um, guides how to predict chroma or from the LUMA samples. Uh, however, uh, uh, at the end, when we have two chromas of that collocated block, we can, while we can get very good uh, savings and compression efficiency improvement, the problem is that the whole process can be quite uh, costly. So what we, we, uh, we try to do um, is again uh, simplify the model in order to achieve uh, results in a more efficient way. Uh, very important uh, here is again attention model. I would like to stress it a little bit more by showing this uh, uh, example because this is what mostly makes this process different than uh, what is used in current standards. Um, so basically, let's see, this is your original block and uh, that its uh, color components have to be predicted from its LUMA and um, all neighboring samples. As you can see here in this example, uh, for example, this, this block is, uh, this pixel is very, very difficult to predict from neighboring pixels. It's better to take into account something that is further away. Um, uh, figuring out this diagonal, uh, um, this diagonal um, uh, color change is also interesting, and this can be done again with attention model, which uh, tells us for reference pixels uh, zero to sixteen. These are the reference pixels zero to sixteen. How will they uh, weigh the, the the predicted chroma for each of the pixels here in fourteen? Uh, sorry, in four by four block. So, uh, for example, um, pixels from from down here 
zero one to three, they uh, they will they will guide how the pixels here in this uh, bottom right corner will be predicted and so on. We have more details in uh, our paper um, at ICIP next week and also um, um, uh, in a revision of a journal paper. So let us know if you are interested to learn more. Um, what we what we did in particular to make uh, uh, this uh, network simpler is to build a multi model which takes uh, any any block size and for any block size learn how to predict uh, color uh, pixels uh, we again played with the idea of removing uh, some uh, spatial um, uh, convolutions which worked um, to remove activations sorry between uh, convolutions on uh, on 2D signals but uh, please don't let this be misleading we still keep lots of activations uh, in particular here where we where we have a tension model it is very important to to use activation functions and also in points uh, where different branches are um, uh, are merged uh, is also very important to keep activation functions. So, for example, from these three uh, by two, three by three con um, convolutions, we remove one activa activation here, and here we remove another one there. Um, here, a similar uh, scheme as uh, before is shown on how to merge three by three um, convolutions. And uh, it is again based on analysis of the receptive fields. Uh, by why we focused on simplification on this part and this part is because uh, these two branches uh, contain 90% of, of the parameters and take uh, not only a lot of memory to store them, but also it takes time to. Uh, predict pixels. Uh, it takes much longer. So after these two simplifications, we have much much simpler uh, models. So from two three by three receptive fields, we uh, learned five by five filter, and here from three by three and one by one, we learned one three by three. We train with more layers, which between them don't have activations, and then post hoc derived. Uh, um, simpler filters. In this case, obviously, we cannot uh, fully simplify this uh, machine learning but uh, algorithm, but it's still much more transparent and more efficient for implementation than the original one. So this is an example of you know, where we still don't have full transparency of what is happening except especially with attention model and so on, but at least we are not using as much uh, uh, unnecessary computations, which is very important for practical in implementations. Uh, the main point of the whole uh, second part of presentation is that interpretability and explainability of machine learning uh, especially those black boxes of uh, machine learning, such as deep learning, is very, very important. And it's, it, it comes in many different ways. There are many different uh, approaches to achieve explainability and uh, interpretability, but they do not necessarily apply to the algorithm you are developing or um, you are learning about. Um, however, uh, if you manage to um, develop interpretability and explainability modules or reuse some, the benefits can be huge. And this is something that a lot uh, can be um, additionally gained in this space. So uh, finally, just to conclude, uh, but machine learning help us to, to innovate. 
which is very obvious in, in our media sector, which uses uh, a lot of visual content. Um, with this great tool come some negative consequences, such as uh, excessive use of computational power, biases in, in system and potential lack of transparency. So when designing or relying on systems which include learned components, good practice include a deep technical understanding of employed machine learning algorithm. Um, then very importantly, careful ethical use of data for training. And um, finally, as we focused on during the last part of this presentation is interpretability and explainability of learned models, which definitely bring uh, uh, additional benefits. So uh, finally, um, I would like to, to highlight that uh, examples of research results presented in, in this paper. Uh, have been mostly achieved in collaboration with our academic partners from Queen Mary University of London and from Dublin City University, thanks to our uh, national and international research grants. Uh, basically, that funding uh, enabled me to assemble this uh, amazing team who, among other work, delivered the, the results presented today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marta. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I think we have learned a lot from your experience. Now we we have some some questions. Uh, I, I'll move to them, but just just to congratulate you on the very nice results also that you have on your research. The only disappointing uh, thing for me was the color of that beer. You know, it <laughs> it really seems uh, tasteless. Tasteless in that case. <laughs> Let me move to Professor Suzin. He's, he's making a question. Very interesting presentation and coloring technique. I uh, was wondering if some situations may have a different behavior, like spilling over the borders of an object. I think it's, it's more like color bleeding sort of problem. Could you discuss a little bit that? Uh, yes, there are problems like that, and we are um, looking into um, into basically uh, object segmentation as part of uh, pre-processing, also used using deep learning, uh, so that uh, we can um, focus more on really sticking the the colors to the to the to the real shape and this can be a big problem but we haven't seen it too much too much in in the in the examples i was expecting more in our results uh, we've seen that in some cases and it's super annoying when when color uh, goes across the boundaries so it's a good question and i don't think it's fully answered but hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll uh, continue to, to until we deliver something, some better results. Okay, uh, Wagner is asking why. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, why are the AI approaches uh, to interprediction not using data in the? Oh my, my window is moving. Sorry, data in the <laughs> lower right blocks. Uh, this is just. Um, unnecessary uh, omission on, on our side. Of course, you can use uh, data in lower right block and, uh, and also in the uh, right, right uh, above block. And that would be um, much better actually. So this is a good, good observation. There is no reason to skip it except um, for getting, for getting results quicker <laughs> as we did. Yeah, there is always this trade-off in terms of the size of your input and, and the sort of results you can get on, on time, right? Uh, 
Professor Guilherme Correa is making a question here. Uh, hello, Marta. Thank you for the very interesting talk Re regarding the transparent models uh, for intra and inter prediction. I'd like to ask you if you notice significant accuracy losses or BD rate losses when using them instead of their counterpart non transparent models. This is uh, exactly what we want, the, the question that we wanted to answer with our research, uh, in addition to understand what has been learned. And uh, uh, we observed that we, we don't have losses. So we have, um, um, I mean, video, video coding is, is very specific. We, in, in video coding, we don't use just machine learning to predict pixels. We keep all these uh, old modes, all of them, right? So we, we and then our, mach our learned modes compete with all the others. We, this is super difficult task because you know how, how optimized these modes are. For decades, people were optimizing them, handcrafted approaches. And this, uh, what, what our, our um, uh, algorithms learn is something additional. And uh, we, without uh, uh, activation functions, these learned models still work okay. So on three cases, on three cases we, we've seen, which is uh, inter, inter and color prediction, we really can make some branches, if not the full models, totally transparent. And we preserve uh, the, the results. Okay. Yeah, uh, I must say that for color, for color, uh, we we typically would would see a little bit uh, more loss in performance, but insignificant really. Okay, thank you. Uh, Guilherme Mota now is making a question. Uh, it's well known aspect in neural networks that the use of linear or no activation functions may lead to a linear model. What is the impact of removing part of the activation functions? Um, so when we, uh, let's say, use one layer instead of uh, more layers, let's say we just increase the receptive field, um, it seems like uh, we don't uh, get features trained as good as when we, you know, have first layer really taking pixel, the next layer taking features, sort of, there is some benefit of training more layers. Um, we, we try to also uh, um, examine uh, better what, what, what has been learned together with activation functions and these activation functions really didn't uh, didn't uh, 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 didn't perform consistently right so i guess um, the the most complicated thing was to consolidate to put together uh, let's say from one input, from one 2D field, you have 64 features, learned features. Then for these 64, you, you do one by one convolution and after that three by three convolution. How to consolidate that into, into simple matrix multiplication? Yeah. Thousands of parameters, how to put them into, into small number of parameters. So a lot of manipulation, uh, was needed there, understanding, you know, which bits to pick. That was super uh, complicated, but I am not sure if I answered the question. Hopefully, uh, otherwise, uh, Guilherme can reinforce the question in a, uh, another way. Uh, Giordano has a question, but I believe it has been answered already. Does the convolutional operation simplification implies in an inherited loss of quality or increasing bitrate. I think you mentioned that when you, you mentioned the modes are on top of the, the others that are already available, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, in this case, I can move to Alex has a really interesting question here. Uh, 
he congratulates you for an impressive work and he wants to know uh, if there's a, any chance to see those GAN coloring techniques uh, working on um, What's, what's the term here on, on real time transmissions? I mean, he asks, okay, if I have a low bandwidth network, could I send a 400 sort of a, a just, just a grayscale and make this coloring at the um, user side? Um, I, th I, I think that the, 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 the most accurate question answer would be not yet. Uh, I mean, there are fully end-to-end uh, -end, uh, machine learning approaches of video compression, which require huge power at the decoder side. And they are not real time now, as far as I know. So I, I think that, uh, you know, one day if, 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 if we have different uh, chipsets in our uh, mobile phones and set-top boxes and smart TVs and if uh, the, 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 f the machine, uh, the deep learning uh, uh, functions are implemented in some less complex way, maybe that will be possible, mm -hmm. but not at the moment. So same for colorization. Yeah, so, sounds good. And actually this connects to Tiago's question uh, because uh, I've, this is uh, really connected to computing effort. The question is how to explore approximate computing when using learning approaches for compression related mechanism. I think like approach search at least as quantization of, of those networks. Uh, how do you see that? Yes. Uh, so uh, quantization of networks, integerization of network this is uh, something that uh, we do use. We use uh, especially in interprediction. I think without any any uh, bigger issues um, for for colorization, we did uh, uh, integer version, and um, basically the quality of um, prediction uh, is highly reduced. Um, so it seems like uh, we, have, we have we've written about it. It's, it's just not published yet. But some answers, I guess, next week during ICAP might be also obtained because people will there also present their works on 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 uh, related topics. It is a challenge. Sometimes even during training, you have to modify. Uh, uh, some uh, steps in order to be able to later on do your quantization or integerization in efficiently. Nice. It so is a it, big challenge, it's, yeah. it's an invitation to see those works on ICIP, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, they will be in the ICIP and the next couple of years various approaches and uh, other approaches will come up, yeah. Sounds great. Uh, if you allow me, um, we don't have other questions from the audience, but I have one, one on my own. Uh, if I got it right, the, the interprediction is done at pixel level, is that right? Uh, so for each pixel, we have different matrix, yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay, but then you have this block level structure. Block level? Um, you, you, you take the borders of the block, so you are completely compliant with uh, current standard style of predictions, that right? Uh, uh, yes, we even, uh, in some implementation we were doing, we, we tried to uh, really, you know, not impose too much um, on, um, you know, what, what on what on pixels that we are take as a predictions as a reference, we wanted to take the same amount as as let's say current standard provides, which is basically two lines or something like that. And you typically you have longer than what I've shown in our results, but I'm not presenting those results uh, here. It's um, uh, 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 VVC, I must mention that VVC already uh, has a learned method implemented 
Um, and uh, this is uh, a very interesting work because it also incorporates a couple of tricks to um, reduce complexity significantly. And uh, for those uh, predictions, interpredictions approaches, uh, your solution is able to uh, somehow deal with the multiple sizes, uh, block size that you may have available because the, the sort of neighborhood you may use uh, changes according to the block size you're using, right? Uh, in our ap approach for inter uh, prediction, we actually had uh, different models from different block sizes. Uh, however, in our most recent work on video, on uh, color prediction, we uh, uh, generalize the model for any block size. So um, I wish we, we did what you asked, but we didn't. <laughs> I think it would be very beneficial. <laughs> yes, yeah, we my, haven't my done question. it. It's exactly in that direction because uh, especially in VVC you have a really huge set of possible block sizes so this is a, a challenge by itself you know. Uh, yeah it's nice okay. to have more general approaches. <laughs> Okay, Marta, thank you once again for the very nice talk. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting you virtually. Hopefully next time we can invite you to come to, to Brazil and give us a talk uh, in person, uh, certainly understand. Uh, if you can, you want to make uh, your final comments, please uh, feel free. And just to, to uh, advertise to everyone, just hold a second. I have a couple announcements to do after Marta. Uh, say say a few words. Thank you, Martin. So uh, I I would like to to thank you very much, not only for inviting me and giving this chance, but also everyone for this uh, um, uh, chance to have discussions with you. Um, that was uh, really uh, uh, very nice, very very good questions and many you know ideas for future directions as well. I I hope. Uh, um, Yes, to meet you another occasion. And uh, yeah, let's keep in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta. Stay, stay happy.